All right, we have the Lord's Supper tonight. We'll be preparing for that. Um, This is a great opportunity to really get into the Spirit of the Lord through the Word. Jeremiah 7, verse number 1. In our study of Jeremiah, we're kind of covering a chapter at a time. I don't anticipate, um, well, I didn't anticipate covering every chapter of Jeremiah, but whenever I think I can skip one, then I just can't. And you know how I can be about that. I really like uh, thorough and systematic teaching in the Word. Now remember Jeremiah, it was just a little review, if you're coming in our study, uh, we call him the weeping prophet. He was called by God to declare the end of the age of Judah. Jeremiah was unique in a handful of ways. Um, one of those was uh, that we, we, we don't see a lot of this, this kind of language about a lot of people, but Jeremiah, the Lord says in chapter number one, God said that he actually ordained him before he was even born to this task. And so he was specially chosen and ordained. I believe that's, um, that's, in, um, that's consistent with the way the Lord God does things. Started the nation on Mount Sinai with a chosen man we know as Moses. And um, he started the age of kings with a man chosen as David. And now he's going to end the nation of Judah with a man chosen in his words, Jeremiah. I'd like to do something as we prepare for Jeremiah chapter number 7. You can put your finger there for just a moment and turn back to Jeremiah chapter 1. And we'll get a quick refresher of Jeremiah's purpose and plan. Now this won't be on the screen, but I'll read it for you and you could just kind of recall this. Um, Well, it might be there. It says, in verse number 10, Jeremiah 1.10, See, I have set thee this day, or set this day thee, over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy, and to throw down, and to build, and to plant. And this is, um, now when we read the prophets, we just read the first part, right? To destroy, to tear down, to stand again. And you kind of, if, you're, if you're not careful, you'll miss that at the end it says also to build and to plant. And while Jeremiah was declaring judgment on the whole nation of Israel and Judah, and what was left of Israel, if you will, and Judah, uh, He not only had the goal of destroying, or in essence, by the words of God, pronouncing destruction, but he was also building and planting for a new era. The kind of words that he laid down are ones that Daniel followed. The kind of words that Jeremiah laid down are the kind that when they rebuilt Jerusalem, they looked to, and even when Jesus Christ came, we looked to those scriptures uh, once and again. As we have read that, we'll just go back. We're going to talk about Jeremiah chapter 7. I think this is true. You will find on every, in every chapter of Jeremiah a uh, declaration of God's judgment and also the ability to rebuild your life through repentance. Jeremiah 7.1 says this, <clears throat> The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there." this word and say hear the word of the lord all ye of judah and say hear the oh, excuse me that enter to these gates to worship the lord for thus saith the lord of hosts god of israel amend your ways and your doings and i will cause you to dwell in this place there it is every chapter of jeremiah not just judgment repentance could change the end result Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are these. For if you thoroughly or thoroughly amend your ways or your do and your doings, we talked about that last week, that it wasn't that um, it's not just what we do, but it's the patterns of behavior, right, that affect our lives. They needed an amendment, not only a short term amendment of of, of what they were, their everyday works, but they needed to change their doings, right? Their, their actual, the long term, um, their behavioral patterns had to change. This is a real challenge for Christians, right? It's easy to amend our doings, but it's hard to amend our ways. 
Right, so this is a great challenge as we work on ourselves and we're a work in progress. He says um, in verse, and I want to I want to highlight verse six and seven as we get there. Amend your ways and your doings. If you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And shed not innocent blood in this place. Neither walk after other gods to your hurt. Um, we need to be clear here. This is a nation, right? A nation with laws. The government was supposed to run on these principles. And we can see in the scriptures the major role of government, can't we? At least of this theocracy. First of all, it was to execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. It was not to oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Not to shed innocent blood in this place. Let me get, in this place. Are we, where are we at right now? Anybody remember? He's standing in the gates of the temple. This, just to give you an idea of how terrible Jerusalem had become, this was not a problem in the outskirts of Jewry or in the kind of, you know, distant places, kind of the wild areas. We're talking about the capital city. We're talking about the temple itself. He says, if you will not shed blood in this place, that's the kind of situation, that's the kind of society they're living in. You want to know how applicable that is? Look at their murder rate in Washington, D.C., right? This is not just a Wild West problem, right? He says, and neither walk after other gods to your hurt. And, and it's interesting that um, in all of these things, he's talking about like God, that the role of government was to protect certain people groups, right? But the last statement says that they were choosing other gods, but he doesn't put it, he seems to like almost separate it from some of the other issues, right, where he says that when you serve idols, it's to whose hurt? To your own hurt. We have a government problem when we don't have justice, right? But we have a personal problem when our worship goes awry, right? He says, Then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave you, or gave to your fathers, forever and ever. That's a pretty strong statement. You know, God, as he pronounces the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, if you keep repenting, we'll do this forever. If you will not just repent with words, but if you'll change your ways, this, this place will never die. That's such a fascinating thing because you kind of get the idea when God declared the destruction of Jerusalem, that, that was it. But he told him, if you would change, we could do this forever and ever and ever. Isn't God's mercy wonderful? We keep making mistakes and we can keep confessing and if we will make a change if we will have true repentance lasting repentance then we god could go on forgiving and giving grace it's got to be real though right we said in verse number um four it said there were lying words saying the temple of the lord the temple of the lord the temple in other words people were saying oh look at the temple of jehovah while worshiping other gods right that's not that's not repentance he says in verse number 8, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal? Which is basically all of the commandments, right? <laughs> There's not many left, okay? And fascinating also is that when mentioning the sins of the commandments, um, we do not see which commandment. Anybody missing one? Honor your father and mother. Which other one? Uh, the Sabbath is missing there too. It's sort of fascinating. So they were probably keeping the Sabbath, like you know, like technically, right? But will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house? which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. So these are church-going people, right? They're showing up on the Sabbath, but they're doing all these terrible things. 
This is the capital, right? There's, there's tradition, but it's totally empty. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Where do we hear that? The den of thieves, Jesus said, make not my house, right? You've made it a den of thieves. He was quoting scripture. Man, almost everything Jesus said you could find in the prophets, can't you? And he says, Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I did set my name at the first. And we see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Just so we're clear. The temple ended up in Jerusalem, right? In the tabernacle. That's where David brought it. Where was it before that? It was in Israel. It was in Shiloh. Some of you guys remember the times of Samuel. The, the, temp, the tabernacle, while it was a tent, was not always in the capital city, and the capital city was not always Jerusalem. And this, is, this was a development later. And now Israel, who had the temple of the Lord, who had the tabernacle of the Lord in Shiloh, they went after other gods and they're gone. And so he's saying, you can look back to the old religious places, to the place where the tabernacle used to be, and look at it. That's what's going to happen here if you don't make a change, where I set my name at the first. So Jerusalem was not the first place that God placed his name. It used to be at Shiloh. And it actually sounds like God put it in Shiloh. So maybe there's a group of people that would say, man, God plays favorites. Why did he pick Jerusalem and Judah? Well, actually, if you look at Jewish history, there's a pretty fair balance between the two. Look at how many years the tabernacle was in Shiloh before Solomon built the temple and how many years that God's house was in Jerusalem. I bet, they, I bet we're, we're running almost even. And it says in verse number 13, And now because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do to this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore pray not for this people. Here's it. Therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayers for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Wow, that is an incredible word, isn't it? Uh, don't even pray for them? Man, now wait a minute. Jesus said, do what? Love your enemies and pray for them, right? Well, this sound, is this a contradiction? Right? These are the kind of questions we have. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the situation in Israel, how it's applicable today, and we'll try to close down in the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open the Word, I want to ask that you would um, bless our time together, that understanding of Jeremiah 7 will be at the forefront of our minds that we would be awakened um, to uh, the ideas behind it would help us to interpret and to grow um, in coincidence with that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, the difference here between some of the other declarations that we had in the past is that he's standing in the temple. You have to understand how brazen a situation this would be. He's not just going in the streets of some random city. He actually came to the capital of the city and he's standing in the gate of the temple, crying judgment against Jerusalem. This is no joke. I mean, just a little while ago, people went into our capital city. Does anybody remember how that ended? You know, it gets kind of touchy, right? When in a country, the politicians start to feel a little bit of the heat, right? It's one thing when cities all over are experiencing, you know, destruction and trouble. But man, I tell you, it didn't matter what side of the line you were on. As soon as they stepped on those capital steps, it got real, didn't it? And people, people are in prison today and being sought out as a result. So Jeremiah wasn't messing around. That's not a political statement, by the way. It's just a parallel. We protect the institutions, protect themselves, right? And so when he standing in the gate he's not just talking about the temple from a distance 
He is crying judgment and lies to the faces of the politicians, of the worship leaders, of the priests, right? This was, in, in that culture, this was the, the power, the seat of power. What's unique about this particular chapter? I think probably the first one is the temple. Is the temple. The idea that the temple was is something hyper-significant. Um, the idea that if there was a temple today, maybe Christians would pay big money to go visit it so they could feel holier, right? And yet, what do we learn from the Scripture? God says, you're saying this is my temple, and it's not anymore, right? So it's, we kind of start, we start to see that God's delight was not in a building, right? That the idea that Jesus brought along where the temple's not a building, it's Jesus Christ, that we are the temple of the Lord, that God wants to dwell in people and not in buildings. That started a long time ago in the times of Jeremiah. As we read through this passage, um, I don't want to like reiterate a ton of the stuff that we've read. Um, I just want to say that there are a handful of sins that came out uh, specifically to me. In the charge that Jeremiah gave these people, um, one of the first things I saw here was the lies. The dishonesty had become commonplace. Commonplace. I was reading, uh, a, well, it's supposed to be a joke. I don't mean it as a joke, but I think it'll illustrate the point well. Um, a bus full of politicians, they were going down the road at a little bit of a high speed, and they hit a curve it couldn't handle, and they crashed onto a farm. And the farmer came out, and uh, he see the accident, the olden days, so he started to dig holes and bury him. And along comes the sheriff, and he says, um, he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, uh, there, was, there was an accident here, and a bunch of politicians died, and I'm burying them. And he said, were they all dead? He said, well, some of them say they weren't, but you know how politicians are. Okay. This is not an act of violence against politicians. The reality is that it's a big joke that in politics you lie. That's what you do, right? And I would say that it's probably been, the, like political people have been accused of that in the past, right? But I think in our culture, lying has become pretty mainstream. And, not, and again, we're a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So it's probably uh, safe to say that if the politicians are all liars, where do we get them, right? <laughs> From among the people, right? So be careful about the stereotypes of politicians because they're basically, you know, a, a reflection at times of what we are, right? Or what we want. And so this, this idea of dishonesty had become mainstream in Jerusalem. I don't know if we're that far in America. It does seem like dishonesty is commonplace, is mainstream, that you could never get anywhere without a few lies, right, in, in politics. And that's kind of the idea that we have. But read the scriptures in regards to Jeremiah. He says to them, he says that, uh, that trust not in the lies, right? Trust not in their lies. We see this over and over. Um, we look at scriptures like uh, uh, verse number... Um, I want to just highlight a couple of those. Verse number four, trust ye not in lying words. Trust ye not in lying words. And verse number eight says this, behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. So we have an issue here. Not only do people tell lies, but they're telling lies because there's a market for them. Right? Remember this, um, a dishonest culture uh, where dishonesty is, it rises, it tells you something about the culture itself, right? It tells us that not only do they lie, but we trust in lies. That is, uh, you know, people can't sell lies where there's no market for them, right? So dishonesty is a problem on two levels. Dishonesty starts with the fact that people don't want to hear the truth. And that's what we read at the end of chapter number 6, right? Chapter number 6 says this. Um, uh, when we were talking about the priests, remember? They said that the, that the, that the priests, they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were 
doing it in their own means. They were preaching the gospel by their own means, their own gospel, right? But it said next, it said, and that's how the people would have it. It said the people would have it so. So we have a, we have a mutual, we have a relationship, don't we? A relationship of dishonesty in our lives. The Christian actually can, instead of just talking about how everybody in the world lies, we could probably look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves, do people around me lie to me a lot? That's a good question. Am I constantly hearing lies? And the second question is this. Why? Right? Why do I trust the lies? Why do I hear the lies? The problem is not that there were a lot of liars in Jerusalem, but that when confronted with the truth of God, people chose the lies, right? They chose to put their trust in those lies. Idolatry was desirable. And imagine how that can how we can get to that place as we're talking about the dishonesty and, uh, of, of these men. We could, uh, we could go through the scriptures. Um, and, and it says in verse Jeremiah 14, 13. Jeremiah 14, 13. Let's turn there for a moment. And these are not lies. Like, like some of us love to be told that we look nice, right? Even when we don't. Some of us love to be told, like, you know, like, <laughs> I, I like to... I like it when people prophesy, right? I, like, I would not like you to lie to me. I would like you to prophesy to me. That would mean maybe, I don't, maybe I'm not that way right now, but maybe I was at some time in the past or I will be at some time in the future, and you could just, you know, you could just apply it today. Like God says that you're a saint. Is God a liar? As a matter of fact, after Jesus Christ came and resurrected, the Christians are never called sinners again. They're called saints. And so, and so God, I mean, how many of you feel like a saint when you wake up every morning, right? Not really, but God says those things, so I'm going to say right here, when we're talking about lies, we're not talking about little, the little things that we say to people in order to be positive, right, to look at the bright side. We're talking about lies. And believing is kind of like Jeremiah 14, 13, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold the prophets. Oh, here we go, because I was, it's easy to talk about politicians. Now I've got to talk about my group, right, the preachers now. We've got to talk about those the, the speakers, right? Those that speak for God. You shall, you shall not see the sword, neither shall you have a famine. That I will give you assured peace in this place. That is the prophecy that was in the mouths of the majority of pulpits in Jerusalem. Can you believe that? Don't worry, everything's going to be great. And I love this word. He says, but I give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them. Neither spake I unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and what? The deceit of their heart. And there's that one. We go back to the New Testament. Both that evil men, wicked men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and what? Being deceived. So the, so the dishonesty in our culture is there because we like it, right? Or at least maybe not you. You're a Christian, right? But the culture probably desires lies. They want that. They want to hear those things. If you want to be told the truth, start demanding it from the people around you, right? Don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. I want you to be honest with me. I don't want you to tell me what. I don't want you to sugarcoat it. Flattery. Is, is, is hatred, the Bible teaches us, right? We need, Christians want, we need to desire honesty in our churches, desire honesty in our families, desire honesty in our lives. See, if, if we don't buy what they're selling anymore, and Christianity is a small group in, in the world, but if the American people decide they don't want to buy lies, or if Christians decide they don't want to buy lies, there's going to be no market for them, right? They're not going to be selling them. And so this is the scripture, there are lies and, and dishonesty. This is crazy too. We talk about the lies. Look at, look at Jeremiah um, chapter 7. We'll go back here, Jeremiah chapter 7. And um, this one blew me away. That is verse number 31. Look what else they were doing. Jeremiah seven thirty one. This is crazy. Now what if I told you that there's a different God than Jehovah? And this God says... Have fun, feel good, rules are for prudes, 
okay? These are easy lies to follow, but I just show you how, how deceived these people were. What if I told you, follow this God, and you can have the privilege of sacrificing your children on a fire? Is that crazy? This is the kind of deceit they come to desire to trust in. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 31. They have built the high place of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Anam. What is the valley of son of Anam famous for? Child sacrifice. It says, and, 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 and they, they burned their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not. And God is very clear about this, about human sacrifice. It never came into his heart. Not one time did God ever, did it ever come into his heart that we would sacrifice children. It's never. He said, but that's what they did. And so when we see the judgment, and God may seem harsh, but this is the issue. We have, we have a perpetual lying situation, right? And then a shameless um, as well. Look at verse number 29. Verse number 29. He says, Cut off your hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentations in the high places. And this is the issue. Even all of this terrible stuff, nobody was even grieving about this. There was, again, we see this over and over, the shamelessness. He says, cut off your hair. And again, um, Jerusalem is pictured right in the last chapter and probably carried over to this as a beautiful woman, right? And, that's, and the cities were often referred to that way, right? The daughter of Zion, right? As a, it was adorned. It was beautiful, right? That's, whenever you talk about beauty in the Bible, oftentimes you're talking about uh, it's typified by a woman. And in those days, it was considered a shame to have, to have short hair, right? And when people would mourn, sometimes they would shave their head in, a, in, a, in an act of mourning. And so he says, that's what, he, that's what we see the cut off the hair there. Actually, that's probably a great way, a great verse if you're ever dealing with, uh, remember 1 Corinthians eleven six 6, when it talks about the woman should not have short hair. And Paul says if she has short hair or her head, or not that, not short, excuse me. If, if her head's not covered, then let her head be shaved. And Paul's kind of like tongue-in-cheek. What he's essentially saying is, you know, if they, if they don't have any shame, and if it's really no big deal, then go ahead and shave your head. And they're like, well, I'm not going to do that. And he's, he's using like an extreme. In other words, if, this is, if, if you're going against the culture and you're doing this and it's no, it's no big deal, then go ahead and shave your hair all the way off. I mean, you wouldn't dare do that, right? I mean, that would be terrible. So this is kind of, as he's talking about the culture in a church, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even bashing short hair. I'm just trying to clarify the argument that Paul was making to him and to those people, and really to many people throughout the ages, shaving your head was a shameful thing, right? It was, it was not something that people really wanted to be a part of, and so he's, he's, he's kind of trying to clarify that uh, through this passage. So Jeremiah uh, 7, 29, I might look at that passage when I'm interpreting 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 16. But this is kind of the summary of this, of this uh, particular chapter uh, we have the differences here lie in that there's a prophecy uh, in Jerusalem in the temple. The prophecy is mainly concerned with the temple and the worship there, the false worship. The way that people were worshiping Baal, sacrificing their children on the altar, and still showing up in the temple. That somebody would murder somebody and then come into the temple. Right? I mean, that's crazy, right, to think. But this is where... The culture had gone, and this is why God's judgment, uh, it seems harsh. We have some other inferences here. If you read this passage carefully, I don't have a lot more time, but he does tell Jeremiah, um, you know, he, he kind of says to him, like, like, see what they're doing, and you kind of get that back and forth between him and God. And finally, I uh, just want to approach uh, this part about intercession. Um, I do not believe this does not mean you should pray for your enemies. I think this was a this was a thing like this. Don't pray for this country, right? Don't pray, don't make intercession. Don't, in other words, uh, don't ask God to bless this nation if they're not going to change. That's the idea. It's not that we don't pray for enemies. It's that on a national level, right? As a, as a nation, as a, like, a, like, like Jerusalem. Oh, pray for Jerusalem. God's like, no, with this kind of sin here, you don't be praying for that. You don't make intercession for them. When they're not going to change, we don't want this in you. God's going to judge it. So I don't think uh, this has to do with enemies 
uh, in, the, in, in the neighbor sense. We learned this already. This, this government system, this worship system had gone way amok. And so praying that God would bless through. And we do that sometimes too, like God bless America. I mean, sometimes I choke on those words, right? Because you're saying like, should God, you know, bless a nation that's uh, number one, you know, in a lot of the sins that God is against, right? So we pray that God not, I try to maybe, I pray just that God will bless America, but that God will be able to bless America because there'll be repentance, right? And the heart will change. And that's what we mean probably by God bless America. Change us, you know, forgive us and, and, and make it a, a, a new place. And that's, so that's uh, uh, where we are at there. Do we have any questions or comments as we're closing down the live stream tonight? Anybody in particular have something in Jeremiah that jumped out at you you'd like to share with us this evening? We have a couple of minutes. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not saying you shouldn't sing God Bless America. I'm just, I think what I'm saying is that uh, you definitely should be, yeah you, yeah, you probably understand that too. You're right. And there was a time and if you sing that song carefully, it talks about America's crowning jewels not being the country itself, but being the spirit of the nation, right? And, uh, and, and I, I, I like, whenever I hear songs like that, I think it's so interesting how people really fixate on the first verse, which was like, which has a tendency to not even be the main one, right? It was like it's like reading the first page of a book and then closing it, right? I mean, the real exciting part is at the end, and we sometimes we don't we don't read we don't even sing all the way through that. You know, it's beautiful for what for Pilgrim's feet, right? Who's stern and you know impassioned, kind of you know the boldness and uh, beautiful for heroes proved, and that's what makes a country beautiful. And I think that's probably the same issue with Jerusalem. What made it a wonderful place was that. People love the Lord, that they were just and honorable, and that's what um, the Christian should look for. Um, I, won't, I won't thrash you if you sing God Bless America. I just, <laughs> I just, uh, it's just something to think about. You know, as Christians, we say a lot of things, but as we truly evaluate the core, we, those, are good, those are good conversations to have with ourselves. I see somebody over here. Oh, uh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I, I'm not sure what I communicated uh, to every individual. My goal was to communicate that, um, that, that just praying for blessing in absence of righteousness is not really a great thing, right? So we always had to keep that. In, we should always be mindful. Yes, good. Yeah. Anybody else? This is good. I, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I'm interested in how, um, how when we, when we're preaching or whatever, what what we leave out or what people are thinking about while this goes on. You know, what about this? Or you said that. What does that mean? This? <laughs> and I never, I, 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 a lot of things I never even consider. You know. Okay, well then let's go ahead and take this time to prepare our hearts as the youth are preparing to make their way in. We can grab our Bibles. I'm going to um, turn to a, different, a little different passage than usual, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 22. Mark 14, 22. As we take this time for some prayer, preparing for the Lord's Supper, I wanted to...